I've been a financial advisor now for over 20 years. And in today's video, I'm going to share with you one of the most important secrets that I learned during that time. It's a five-step process that I think helped me become a much more successful investor, and I think it'll help you as well. So let's go for a walk and talk about it. You know, the first step in this process is really understanding where does success come from with investing? What are the things that matter and what are the things that don't, right? Because you want to focus your time on the things that are going to move the needle and are going to matter. And frankly, so many people spend most of their time on things that aren't really going to move the needle. So step number one is understanding what that is. And the answer to that is it's asset allocation. What percent of your portfolio is going to be in stocks and bonds? And I know that sounds boring, but multiple studies have shown that 80% of your success as an investor is based on this asset allocation. Now, there's times in your life where having a more aggressive asset allocation makes sense. More stocks, less bonds, more volatility, a bumpier ride, but likely, a higher return over time. And then there's other times in your life where having a less risky portfolio makes sense as you're getting closer to retirement, as, as the money in your nest egg is everything you're ever gonna put into it is now in that nest egg. And job number one is don't lose money, right? Protect the nest egg. And job number two is never forget about job number one, which is protect that nest egg. So the first step in this five-step process is to really get your asset allocation right. And candidly, it's hard to do that on your own because your life changes. And as your life changes, you know we're going through our lives for the first time. Um, but a financial advisor, an accountant, and an investing professional has helped hundreds or thousands of families on their journey and has learned through their experiences. So because of the importance of asset allocation, I think you might want to consider working with a professional to get that right. Okay, step number two is I want you to think in years. I, don't, I do not want you to think in percentages. If I ask most people, how are you invested? Most people are going to say, well, I'm 70% you know, exposed to equity, stocks, mutual funds, ETFs. I'm 70-30, 70% stocks, 30% bonds, or 50-50 half stocks, half bonds. But I don't want you thinking that way. I want you thinking in years. And in particular, how many years worth of stable, secure bonds do you have for funding your living expenses? How many years could you fund your living expenses from your bonds? Bonds that are maturing in six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months. How many years worth of living expenses do you have in those bonds? Because what I want you to avoid being is a forced seller in a down market. That's how most people really hurt themselves. You get the asset allocation right, and you avoid being a forced seller in a down market, and you're going to do really well. Most people, or the odds are going to be more in your favor, I should say. I can't guarantee that you're going to do really well, but you're going to have a lot of the, the factors that hurt a lot of people under control. So how do, you, you know, how do you do that? How do you get the, the avoid being a forced seller in a down market? Really two ways, right? First is the mental challenge. It hurts a lot when the stock market is down. And so getting that asset allocation right so that you buffer out some of that pain if the stock market, like in the great financial crisis, which was down top to bottom, the S&P 500, almost 60%, 60 percent, six zero percent. If you had a half, of, a half a million dollars in stocks, you were down almost $300,000 and just had 200,000 left. That, that will not cause you to worry at night, that will cause anguish and anxiety. And, and it'll keep you up at night and it's gonna tempt you to make you blow out of the market at the low. And, and because of the mental pressure, be a forced seller in a down market. So that's one way that people become a forced seller in a down market. The other way is they have, they need cash and they have no choice but to sell stocks that are low to raise cash. Either, you know, tip, the most common way this happens is because people have debt payments that they have to, they have to pay. Maybe you have a loan 
for your business and it's a five-year loan at the end of five years you have to pay off what's called the balloon payment so that's one way uh, people get get caught up in that real estate developers commonly have that challenge and hopefully they've thought through that and have risk controls in place the other way is just by living expenses right you need fifty thousand dollars from your investment portfolio to fund your expenses for the next 12 months well if all you have is stocks and your stocks are down 20, 30, 40%, you don't have a choice. You have to sell something low. But if you have stable, secure bonds, you can say, well, I've got a bond maturing in a month. We'll use that money for funding our living expenses. So number two is, you know, I want you thinking years, not percentages. How many years worth of living expenses do you have in place? Number three, is and I've kind of alluded to this but number three is risk you know how do you think about risk what is risk is risk when you turn on the news or you watch uh, the news on your on your phone or you watch YouTube and and they say oh the market's down five percent the market's down ten percent year to date as I film this the market's having a great year but is risk those years where the market is down or is risk the likelihood of not achieving your long-term goals. I would say that day-to-day -day volatility is really noise. And you can plan for that by the asset allocation, right? As long as you're not touching your money when it goes down, you're not a forced seller in a down market. But so many of us think of risk as, you know, is the market up or down and that's risk. I would argue oftentimes, particularly for younger people that, that need to let their money compound and grow, what society views as low risk, which might be money in an FDIC insured bank account, you know, typically those pay less than inflation. And if you, if you need your money to grow over 30, 20, 10 years to, to reach your goals, and you're not beating inflation, guess what? Compounding is working against you, not for you. So I want you to rethink how you think about risk, which is, Am I more likely or less likely to reach my goal with this strategy? And I want you to pick the strategy that's right for you that you can stay with for a long period of time, but that helps you reach your goal. So again, it's counterintuitive, but don't think of risk as the daily ups and downs of the, of the stock market. That's a feature of the stock market. That's not a flaw, that's not a bug. It's just the nature of the stock market, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's riskier than some of your other options. Okay, number four, I want you to begin with the end in mind. And what I mean by this is we're saving money for retirement. So let's spend some time thinking about what does this look like? What is my saving strategy? What is my investing strategy look like when I'm 55, 60, 65, or 70? And oftentimes people don't think about that. And then they end up in a situation where all of their money might be in a tax deferred, a regular IRA, a regular uh, 401k. And every dollar they take out of their accounts, they've got to pay ordinary income tax on. Right. Think about how is it going to feel when you're 65 years old and you need to take money out of your account to buy groceries, to buy gasoline. But every time you take money out, you have to pay order, it's taxable income to you. So rather than just having all of your money in one bucket, I want you to think, be, start with the end in mind. And I want you to think there's typically tends to be three buckets. There's the bucket I just talked about, which is a, what I call a tax me later account, because later in your life, you're gonna have to pay, it's gonna be taxable income for you. Then there's, the regular bank account, the tax me as I go, the regular bank account, the regular brokerage account, money that you have uh, that you're getting regular 1099s from and you're paying tax on every year. So you have a tax me as I, as I go account, which is that account. And then the third one is a, what I, uh, with flaws, call tax me never account, which is the Roth version of the IRA in the Roth version of the 401k. So why, why do I say that's with a flaw? It's a, the flaw in calling it a tax me never account. Um, and if I misspoke and said tax me later, the Roth versions are, are tax me never accounts. And the flaw in that name is 
the money you put into those accounts were after tax dollars. So you didn't, you didn't get the tax break on the way in. So it's not truly a tax, tax me never account. If, if you wanna know, there is one of those. It's called the health savings account. You can look it up. But that's, that's got the trifecta. That's your putting money in in pre-tax dollars. It grows tax-free. And if you use it for uh, qualified medical expenses, um, then you can take money out tax-free. So that's a true tax me never account. But I use this term and, and you have to have what's called a high deductible health care plan to qualify to do it. There's no income limits on it. Anybody can put money into a health savings account as long as their health care insurance is what's called a high deductible health care plan. But getting back to the Roth version, the, the wrongly labeled, but still what I call a tax me never account. So begin with the end in mind and think about how you're gonna get taxed in those buckets. This has a big, big impact. This can be thousands of dollars, often tens of thousands of dollars, and, and sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars in tax savings by thinking through how you're gonna be taxed and where your money's gonna be once you're in retirement. So begin with the end in mind on that. The next thing, um, I said it's a five-step process. This is step five, but I've got two bonuses for you that I think are super important, so stick around after this one. And, and the next one is not all money is created equally, okay? And income equals freedom. So as we start getting older, as we're approaching our 50s, we're in our 50s, I think there's a lot to be said for creating a portfolio that's generating income. Because when you can get your income from your portfolios to match what your, your income needs are for living, then you've got freedom. You can decide if you want to retire. You can decide uh, if, if you want to do something else, if you want to leave your job and maybe like, make less money and, and focus on other passions that you might have. So income equals freedom. And there's... There's, but there's different types of income. There's passive income and there's active income. And passive income equals freedom. Active income could, be, could mean you're working harder than you are in your current job. You know, if, if you have uh, a portfolio of rental income property, so you're, you're renting out homes, like the homes behind me, to tenants, you know, when a hot water heater breaks, you know, you or somebody you're paying is changing out that hot water heater. Uh, when a tenant doesn't pay rent, that's your headache, not somebody else's. So I like passive income. So thinking about how can you generate passive income from your portfolio? And a really one, one nice way to do that is with a portfolio of high quality dividend paying stocks. Not companies necessarily that pay the highest dividend, you want high quality companies that have a great market position, have reasonable balance sheets, have great management teams, and importantly, have a history of raising their dividend rates at a rate faster than inflation. So if you're getting $1,000 a year in dividends from one company, five years from now, it's kept up with inflation. And if you can choose those companies wisely, if you can build a portfolio of those, once you've got your income needs met today, you're probably gonna be fine in the future as well because it's gonna keep up with inflation. Now, it's hard to find these companies, and I should say, none of what I'm sharing with you today is financial advice for you. This is financial. These are things I want you to have on your radar screen to be thinking about or to bring up a conversation with somebody that you hire that's a fiduciary to you that's gonna put your interest first. They're a smart person, but they're, they're using those smarts to benefit you as opposed to trying to sell you something. You know what the most expensive financial plan is that you can get? The most expensive financial plan you can get is a free financial plan. If, an insur if somebody that sells insurance does a financial plan for you, guess what? <laughs> uh, it's gonna say you should have some insurance products in there, right? And whether you should or not, you know, you want somebody that's unbiased looking at that and say, you know, based on your situation, here's what you need. But if that's how they get paid, there's going to be a big temptation um, to say that you need insurance. And I'm not saying that 
fee-only financial advisors are the only good financial advisors. There's lots of good financial advisors. But how do you know what they're recommending to you is, is your best interest. And I don't want to have a shadow of a doubt. I don't want to have a kernel of a, of, of a, of a doubt that the advice somebody's giving me is, is not what's best for me. Because if you have just a kernel of doubt, that kernel is going to grow and is going to become a burr over time and it's it's going to be a, a challenge for you when things when you need to be able to stay the course the most when the market is down so uh, think about freedom and when it comes to building a dividend stock portfolio when it comes to everything i'm talking about i think having a professional work with you makes sense okay let's keep going bonus next bonuses uh, <laughs> the next one the first bonus is liquidity is king not all income investing, not all growth investments are the same. How quickly can you liquidate that position and what kind of haircut are you going to take if you, if you need your money? And you know what? As we get older, liquidity needs, as we start needing our money, having liquidity is important. For instance, some people will invest in like venture capital firms or private equity firms that are buying companies, venture capital firms back startup companies. Those investments might do really well over time, but let's say you have an unexpected expense. Um, you know, you have a medical expense and, and all of a sudden it's like, you know what, I need an extra $10,000 a year or my taxes came in quite a bit higher and I need to uh, get $50,000 that I don't have. You know, if you're in a public market, for the most part, it's fairly easy to get, get your money back when you need it and not have to take a big haircut. Uh, on that, but if, if you're in a, one of these private illiquid investments, you have to find a buyer and you might take a big haircut. So another, that bonus is liquidity is king. Another bonus is boring is good. I don't like exciting investments, right? Which is why, you know, maybe I missed out on some of the hot IPOs of the world when I was younger. Uh, but on the other hand, it's the slow and steady. You wanna be the tortoise, not the hare. Some of those hairs do really well, but most of them get burnt along the way. So boring is good. And then I've got to go back to the basics. You know, all of this, this investment process that changed my life, that helped me succeed as an investor, it's all built on a foundation. And that foundation is a stable and secure financial life. And that begins by having a, a, an emergency fund in place, three to six months at least of cash flow needs, of living expenses, somewhere that's fully liquid, like at the bank down the street from you. You might not be maximizing um, your return on that money, but that money is there in case, you know, you break an arm and you need extra money. It's, it's like two thirds of Americans cannot cover a $1,000 uh, surprise expense. I don't want that to be you. And in particular, as we get older, as we approach our 40s or 50s and beyond, if you're still working, I want you to be in a position where if you lost your job and you wanted another job, you don't have to take the first job that comes along, that you have the dry powder to give yourself three months, six months, or maybe even a year of time to find the right job for you so you can optimize on your life as opposed to uh, taking the first job that comes along. And speaking of optimizing on your life, this video up here talks about seven things that I, I want all of us to stop doing. I want you to stop doing. As you approach your 50s and 60s before you retire, yes, getting to retirement is nice. It's a great goal, but it's also important to enjoy the journey. And that's what this video is. Seven things to stop doing as you approach retirement so you can enjoy the journey more. Thanks for watching this video and I'll see you in that one. Bye bye.